everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG, and I'm really thrilled to be here today. We have an amazing speaker, very popular, Wahid Rahman. Dr. Rahman will be as director of geoscience uh, at Impact Exploration Services. He's going to be talking about the geochemistry of unconventional petroleum, an Anadarko basin case study, and he has some amazing insights. So I'm just really excited about that. Also want to thank our sponsors for this um, today, and we'll I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And I'd like to encourage everyone to mute and also turn off your camera so that we'll have um, maximum bandwidth for for the presentation. And as you have questions, which I'm sure you will, let's make sure that you share them in the question and answer box. We do do have a chat box, but it's kind of hard to keep up with the questions if you put them there. So let's just go ahead and put them in Q&A and Dr. Rahman will um, address them at the end of his presentation. So thank you everyone. And just want to let you know that you are, um, this is a part of APG Academy uh, webinars. It's also, I would like to encourage you to join um, AAPG and Renew if you have not. And welcome. So welcome, Dr. Rahman. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so very much. Uh, I just want a little bit of technical thing. I see on my monitor, I don't see the full monitor. Should I uh, do some sort of adjustment here? No, this is perfect. Don't don't touch a thing. <laughs> just, just forward it. <laughs> That's it. You. Thank you so very much. Uh, so am I good to go, Susan? Yes. Okay. Thank you for showing up, everybody. And it's a, it's a great opportunity, uh, Susan, for me and my company, Impact Exploration Services. Uh, and I'm really glad to be here uh, to talk about this uh, most popular basin in the world. It's uh, one of the super basin uh, and a dark basin. So I'm going to be talking mostly un 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 unconventional uh, geochemistry, unconventional petroleum systems, uh, and the case study is from Anadarko Basin. So before I start, I will start with a slide uh, with Anadarko Petroleum, Anadarko Basin's petroleum system. So what you see in your slide, and this slide is borrowed from uh, my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Jiang uh, from Jada Wire Petroleum Systems blog. And you can see in the Super Basin, Anadarko Basin, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and part of uh, a little bit of Colorado and, and you know, Nebraska probably. So the, the map is a little bit different way. Here you see the oil, uh, in most of the lateral and vertical uh, wells in the Anadarko Basin petroleum systems, which the oil migrates up to very, very far north, you know, four to 500 kilometers, uh, almost close to the uh, Kansas northern border, and even part of uh, the Colorado and, uh, and Nebraska. So you see the greens here. Uh, so the north is on the right side of the map, and you see all these oil oils, and then the, the gas wells, and the mix of gas and oil wells in the Oklahoma side. And the kitchen is very close to the Oklahoma-Texas border, to you almost, yeah, on the southern part of the Oklahoma. Uh, you see a cross-sections A to A prime here. We see um, how deep the basin is uh, in the southern Oklahoma side, where the kitchen is. And here, the famous uh, uh, source stock is the old Ford shell. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in a little bit. I want to focus on here. Look at the GOR numbers in this uh, uh, walls. Uh, these are the reported GOR. Uh, and you see these are very low GOR oil, it's mostly oil. And then you go to the southern side, you get a mixture. So what happens, hundreds of kilometers of migrations toward the north. And, uh, you know, the trends goes to further, as I said, to the Nebraska ball. The border, Kansas Nebraska border. Here is the uh, petroleum systems, the main part of that, the migration systems. Look at that. Uh, so, the, from the kitchen here at the southern part of Oklahoma, all the oil is getting migrated toward the north, northeast, uh, north, northwest, you know. And if you see, there are some faults in that map. 
Again, this map is uh, borrowed from uh, Zetaware. Uh, these are the basement falls. So there are a lot of falls in the Pennsylvania sites that we don't report it here, uh, but you would see in that part of my talk when I zoom in the study area in the, uh, in, in the Oklahoma side. Uh, so orange here, uh, orange line here is showing the, the boundary of the mature part of the Woodford Shale, which is the main source of in, in this basin. And as I said, you know, I have thermal maturity map in a later part, but this is probably around 0.9% maturity equivalent to boundary. And this, there is significance on that when I say 0.9% thermal maturity equivalent boundary. Uh, that has been, uh, when I started my oil and gas career, I had a career that I started as a hydrogeologist where I used to just model uh, water flow. Uh, in groundwater and the contaminations in water. So, but I switched my career, you know, um, after my PhD uh, to take an oil and gas job as an organic geochemist. So now I, I deal with the oil migrations, oil flow, oil, oil and gas modeling, those kind of stuff. But I do with a fine-tuned geochemistry. I just don't do the model. I, I, I justify my model with the ground truthing with a little bit of drop of oil and a gas. Uh, uh, you know, I still do brine water chemistry, a lot of stuff. So, but what I'm showing here that oil is uh, getting sourced from here, getting migrated all the way. So if you uh, count the, the very little um, uh, migrations here from the center of the, um, the kitchen to the, all the way to the, the periphery of the basin, you know, it's probably four to 500 miles. So that migration is very common. and. All the wells drilled in the you know, Gerana Darko Basin in you know, all are here. And most of this data are probably um, published in uh, USGS published a 4D basin modeling a few years ago by Deborah Hegley. So those data are here too. And you see that you, you got in gas fields, which is a, a major gas field uh, in the world and also the major source of um, the helium gas, if you guys don't know. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, helium gas field in the world. I think the the largest onshore helium gas field is still the, you know, whatever the helium got produced, 80% or 90% of helium got produced from these basin. And um, so, you know, so that's another information I'm giving you. Uh, so my focus area would be on the Oklahoma side. So I'll try to zoom in on the, on the Oklahoma map here. So here in Oklahoma map, and that would be basically the outline of my talk today. And you can see here, that's the Anadarko Basin, and this is probably part of Arkoma Basin, and but this this system scores together. This is your Nimahar, um, Nimahar Fault and Nimahar Ridge uplift here, and then our focus area would be uh, would be just uh, the upper part of the Anadarko Basin and the Oklahoma Kansas border, including the Stag Scoop and and Cana Field. So I'm zooming in there. So I'm fine tuning this little part of my model here. Uh, with the uh, gas chemistry, oil chemistry, and soil soil chemistry. So what uh, what are we going to cover here in the talk today? I'll not go too much on the geology. My geology friends are going to probably get very mad if I start talking about geology. <laughs> uh, so I will I'll try to cover a little bit of the geology. Then I will I will try to uh, work on my uh, my subject matter expertise and taking this geochemistry data how I can actually interpret the petroleum systems in a different way than, than we haven't been looked at uh, conventionally. So when I started uh, these projects, I remember um, it is uh, most of the data are published from here. And, and I used to work at Devon Energy at Oklahoma City. Um, I'm grateful that they gave me the pub uh, publications authority on that. Uh, so these are a few publications we made uh, uh, from these in, in different conferences uh, and different uh, APG Arctic uh, presentations and very local societies too. So what do you see, what you would be seeing here, the reason I started these projects, uh, we started this project because we are working on an um, a stack play in Oklahoma. We were looking at a very low thermal maturity range in the Kansas-Oklahoma border where uh, Woodford thermal maturity is probably around 0.5%, 0.6%. And somewhere at the boundary where you see the shallow shelf here, um, uh, shell versus uh, the deeper part of the basin right here. Uh, the um, thermal maturity um, uh, then published one, I, I believe that was USGS published. Uh, it was uh, showing a little bit low maturity 
So um, most of us who are thinking, you know, this is not going to be working. Um, hydrocarbons are not going to be good enough there. Uh, so uh, so when we, we took a project, so we wanted to understand the thermal maturity first. So I started looking at uh, some of these organics, uh, separating the carogens uh, and looking at the organic petrography of it. And I see different, different assemblages of organic matter in there. Of course, the carogens are so finer. It's, we sometimes call it marine snow, so it's uh, structureless. And whereas uh, organic matter macerals, when you get it from coal, you can see that structures of organics. So it's very easier to find out the thermal maturity. But uh, so we started looking at very carefully and we found out some of this, uh, uh, some of this organic matter in, um, were, you know, um, you know, uh, assessed previously, but those were not actually uh, vitronite. Those are probably solid bitumen. So solid bitumen is pretty interesting. It's a very vague term. It has a very different shades from low maturity to high maturity. At the very beginning of uh, solid bitumen has a low maturity reading with the reflectance, right? And so that kind of triggered uh, this low maturity range here. So we wanted to look at it, that one piece. And the another piece was uh, uh, there was a conception, pre-notion conceptions during that time that, you know, you, to make an unconventional well, you have to make it, uh, you have to drill a well where you have a thermal maturity 0.9% or above. So I was like, no, it's not probably the truth because if that's the truth, you know, we still have the unconventional clay somewhere in the, even a southern part of the Kansas, we put one shallow well, uh, we find, I'm sorry, uh, Woodford well, literally we find a lot of oil and gas. So how those gases are coming in. So because everybody was thought it's a locked hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon didn't move. So there is another piece I thought, oh no, hydrocarbon is always moving. As soon as hydrocarbon expels from the corrosions on the rocks, it will create its own pressure and move out. And that's how I showed you that the 500 kilometer migrations uh, to the uh, northern part of the you know, Anada, sorry, uh, the Kansas, uh, is, is the proof of that. So unconventional is probably a very engineering term where you have the rock is very low permeable, low transmissivity. Uh, but it doesn't have much about the organic matter maturity. So it, the migration is always there. So that's another piece to be proven here. So, and I'll say it on this slide, let's move on to the next one. Value geography wise, I wanted to show these things. You know, it's a, it's a Lake Devonian uh, um, paleogeographic map, map from Blakey. Uh, it's about uh, 360 million years ago. You can see um, the Woodford uh, shell, where it's very organic rich and silicious mud rocks deposited in this basin, it is the similar time. Uh, uh, there are other major basins like New Albany here, Marcellus here, Bakken here. So you can see a lot of uh, shale got deposited during time. It is deposited in a very shallow epicontinental sea during a uh, Devonian period, a late Devonian period, early Mississippian period. And this is the primary source rock of hydrocarbon. Uh, in Anadarko Basin. Uh, so far, we have had uh, done work on uh, many part of Anadarko Basin, including Kansas uh, and and, uh, and the northeast part of the yeah, Texas Panhandle. We, we see uh, most of the hydrocarbons are sourced from uh, um, um, Woodford Shale in different layers of uh, even, even um, you know, our late Mississippi and Pennsylvania rocks are holding hydrocarbon, which is actually sourced from uh, Woodford Shale. So, uh, going to the, uh, I want to give you a little bit on the, the petrophysics uh, of uh, uh, logs, but again, I'm not a petrophysicist. Uh, I'm looking at here, wood forts are divided uh, divided into three different parts, upper wood fort, lower wood fort, and middle wood fort. So what we historically have seen, the upper wood fort has, uh, has a very target uh, part. Most of the people target the upper wood fort because it is a little bit of a um, um, uh, dolomitic um, uh, um, uh, and less clays uh, compared to the lower root board and uh, uh, quartz uh, and pyrite and of uh, the TOC, you can see four to um, almost 12%. And middle um, middle uh, wood board is here, TOC two to 10%. So I have seen in wood board <laughs> in close to the Nimahari is about 20% TOC. You know, you can imagine as you go to the shallower part, you will have higher TOC. If you go to the deeper part, you will see lower TOC. So, so there is a variation here. I want to give a little bit of petro, um, uh, petrophysical log from uh, uh, Merrimack and other stacked clay. Here, um, 
So this is your Woodford uh, Osage. There is a Mississippi line here in between, and then the Merrimack at the top. Merrimack has different benches, like five or six benches, and uh, and these are all uh, producible. These are all has uh, hydrocarbon, and this can be very easily mappable and correlatable. And um, and to calibrate the boundaries here, this is a uh, uh, published data as well uh, from uh, one of my friends, Buddy Price, who was my co-worker. He still works at Devon. Uh, the fantastic geologist. Uh, so I will cover a little bit of Mississippian structure, which I mentioned at the very beginning of the first map. Uh, didn't have this Mississippian structure. These are very fine-tuned geophysical data. And you can see a lot of strikes leave faults here. The majority of uh, the faults are uh, the fracture networks develop around these faults. And these are in Pennsylvania times. So when we talk about the stack and scope play um, in the Anadarko Basin, we see these hydrocarbons are migrating following this fault controlled area. So these are the places where we see some of the high GOR, uh, uh, high GOR uh, fluid coming into the play. So uh, that was another question. So why we see high GOR in the middle of a uh, um, uh, sort of a 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7% uh, maturity um, rock. So, uh, so these are the these are the things I want all of you to consider. Uh, that how um, these migrations actually happen. I'll, I'll show you on that in, in coming slides. So here, the objectives of the talks. I think I, I tried to cover a whole lot of stuff at the very beginning, but this is a concise one. Uh, you notice I used here uh, uh, the petroleum. Uh, uh, Woodford, Maramac, Osage, within parentheses, I put a sign of exclamations, uh, the petroleum systems of Anadarko Basin. I am pretty sure uh, in the audience who are old enough, we remember all of, um, you can remember the McGoon and Wally Dow's 94 famous paper that uh, the petroleum systems, uh, in, in a, petroleum systems in uh, in a three different way, known petroleum systems, the speculative petroleum systems and possible petroleum systems are proved possible, probable, those, those concepts, right? So this uh, design, remember us, uh, um, um, make us remember that this is a known petroleum system that would for produce petroleum and it migrated uh, into the Osage and Maramec system. So the petroleum coming in in um, uh, in Woodford um, from Woodford and getting stored in Merrimack and Osage. So Merrimack and Osage are reservoir. Woodford is the source rock. So source rock and reservoir rock. Um, the hydrocarbon is known as correlated. Uh, this is coming from Woodford source. So so that's what it is. Uh, we we are establishing so the, the thermal maturity RO equivalent from solid bitumen and comparing the maturities from source rock to produced oil. So remember, if you have a true unconventional uh, rocks, if that geologically, that in all raw hydrocarbon did not migrate and stayed in the same rock, so that the maturity of the fluid and maturity of the rock should be very close to each other, so then we can say, well, migration is pretty zero. So that's what I was trying to uh, find out. And, uh, and, and then taking these, uh, oil and gas uh, maturity and converting these to uh, hydrocarbon uh, um, uh, fluid properties to, to understand the behavior of the fluid, meaning oil and gas, um, you know, GOR and other things uh, that can be done. Um, and, and then a better understand the, the pathways, how the migrated uh, migration happened from source to the sink and, and an overall understanding of the uh, GOR, you know, a, a geochemist, uh, is a good one when it matches with some engineering data. When engineers comes and play around with geologists, and then it, it gets correlated to each other. That that is a, that is a complemented stuff. So on the right hand side, you can see one of the, um, the SEM pictures. So while uh, pyrolysis is happening, uh, and I think it is published from one of the OU studies uh, by O'Brien, and I think Roger Slide was part of that too. Uh, you can see here the hydrocarbon molecule uh, getting produced. Uh, sorry, my mouse is not moving, so I couldn't I couldn't show you that bubble coming out of the um, uh, uh, the source rocks and try to get out. So this is what you see um, that oil actually it doesn't matter how tight the rock is, hydrocarbon migrates out pretty 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 easily. 
uh, uh, it creates its own pressure and then it creates its own pathway. And that is when you have more hydrocarbon gets produced, more pressure comes in and it gets pushed out. And then if you have the geologic control like faults uh, or some sort of dust, then those, so those helps uh, tremendously. So the methods and workflows are very uh, similar here. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we use some organic petrology work, taking the rocks, uh, getting the kerogen out, doing the thermal maturity equivalence and doing the kerogen assessments, looking at the source rocks, which also gives you some sort of uh, kerogen assessments. The first one is visual, the second one is uh, instrumental. Uh, so you get the TOC, rocky bulb, the pyrolysis or, or source of analyzer, whatever you call it. I have a hog analyzer in, in my shop. So, so we do uh, the same way. And then oil, from the oil samples, we, you, can, uh, you can do the oil extracted from your rocks and then get a whole lot of GC and biomarkers. And of course, our geochemists, we talk about <laughs> GC. We do SARA analysis when you do biomarkers. So you separate it, uh, saturated aromatics, raisin, and asphaltines. And then you take the biomarkers from aromatics, biomarker from saturates, and you can take these numbers and convert back to the thermal maturity in a different way. There are many different ways. There are a lot of geochemists uh, that are doing that. And then from the gas samples, you can do the similar thing. You look at the gas compositions and you look at the gas isotopes, convert those isotopes into thermal maturity equivalent. On the right-hand side, you see different chromatograms. I'm, I'm just showing you at the very top, uh, whole oil GC is a 40 API gravity oil. You can uh, you can see uh, 40 API gravity oil uh, and look at the left side of that chromatogram. Uh, you have very, very high abundances of uh, light hydrocarbon. And as you go to the heavier hydrocarbon, it kind of goes down, right? That's the characteristics of the unconventional or the continental or the lower 48, any any shell or any 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 tight rocks we are producing hydrocarbon from that's the characteristics of hydrocarbon. You see a lot of light hydrocarbons. So one to one correlations is very, very important. Apple to apple correlations is very, very important. And the middle one is another chromatogram. So it is coming from um, a very known, heavily used um, chromatogram from um, M over C191. It's a saturated biomarker. So we we call it in our language. Uh, um, you know, terpenes uh, and, and, and pentacyclic terpenes, uh, and tetracyclic terpenes, hopenes, homopenes, those are all coming in here. So we take a lot of these pigs and convert it in X, Y plot or three-dimensional, four-dimensional plot to make you understand this. I promise these are going to be the last chromatograph I'm showing it. When geochemists do that, a lot of people get lost. So the bottom one is another uh, heavily used chromatogram uh, is in a styrene um, hydrocarbon from M over Z281, uh, where we, we talked about different types of styrene, uh, 27, 28, 29. So, uh, so we, I'm going to plot this data in an XY plot and then a, or maybe three-dimensional part of triangle or diagrams. No more, than, no more chromatograms from a geochemist here for the, for the audience. So here is the kerogen types and, and the maturity of the source rock. So you can, it's a very simplified way. I just put three different uh, uh, maturities, 0.5%, 0.9%, 1%. So you'll see, as you see on the Van Kraveling diagram, 0.9% high to see a high hydrogen index and the um, low maturity. And then as it goes higher maturity, everything goes kind of down toward following the Van Kraveling diagram. Don't worry about the type one, type two, type three, and most most of these are heavily type two kerogen, even though it's just the artifact of the plotting. And you can see two diagrams. I plot one on the left side, one on the right side, and they are in between one and two. And as it gets mature, what happens? It loses the hydrogen, and it it captures because of the pyrolysis oxygen plasma um, it changes some of the nothing I'm, I'm over explaining, but and that happens very common, so it goes to the type three age. That does not mean that these uh, kerogens are type three. So type three kerogens are strictly restricted for coal. Uh, and you may find um, a little pieces of coal here and there, but not majority. So if the coal base introduced a hydrocarbon, we would have inundated with hydrocarbon all over the country and to the US, you know, if you look at the coals all over there. Um, so the type three is kind of an artifact. I, well, this is my one of the emphasis I always give in my talks, and I'm going to have um, a graph here in a, in a so 
uh, in the next slide, uh, sorry, the pictures here in the next slide. So the maturity effects brings this uh, in, a, in a type three, type three or four domain, but the type three and four uh, carriage it does not produce hydrocarbon. Just just remember that. Uh, uh, not too much. It does, but it's very very low. So here is the uh, solid vitamin versus vitronate uh, um, conversations. Uh, so determining ROE in the shell in low maturity organics uh, with presence of vitronite like solid bitumen is a challenging. The reason I say challenging is solid bitumen is a low thermal maturity range because it is going to be rich with hydrogen. So it's going to actually reflect less. The more hydrogen means in the in the carrageen that you have you have more uh, liquids in there. So it's going to be kind of dumping uh, or it's going to reflect less as you start maturing uh, the the bitumen, the solid bitumen or kerogen, you're gonna produce hydrocarbons. So remember, uh, think about a methane molecule. A methane molecule gets produced from a source rock. It will take one carbon and four hydrogen out of that kerogen or that bitumen. So the more you to think about a bigger hydrogen, bigger hydrocarbon molecule, like I will give you a, a, a pentane. So it's a C5, uh, uh, H, H2N plus two, right? So it's about uh, 2 and plus 2, so 12 hydrogen is taking in. So think about that as you go C40 range. So the more you, you mature it, it takes more hydrogen out. So it become the leftover carrageen become more um, carbon-based. So the more carbon-based are going to be more reflective. So what happens with the solid bitumen, as you mature it, it turns into pyrobitumen. It's going to read more maturity than the equivalent bitumenite reflectance. Whereas in low maturity range and the solid bitumen where you have more hydrogen in it, it's gonna, be, it's gonna read low thermal maturity compared to the bitumen, compared to the uh, equivalent bitumenite. So you need to have a conversion. So sometimes people mistakenly are gonna petrograph and look at it and then they try to match your results with the rock people and this. Uh, so need to be very, very be careful on that. So what happened in the solid bitumen here, you can you can see on the figure on the left-hand column on the, on the organic petrology diagram, uh, sorry, uh, picture, photomicrograph, uh, there, there's a bit, uh, bit, uh, vitronite piece in there, which is a very nice structure. So you can see vitronite, but most of these are solid bitumen, structureless. You see very blob of uh, a hydrocarbon uh, rich, uh, you know, piece there on a, the the second photomicrograph on the top right hand, you can see a piece of solid uh, bitumen, no um, no um, structure in there. And uh, see bottom left one, you see um, uh, an organic matter called telalginite. It's an algae. On the fluorescent slide, you can see how fluorescing it is. Uh, to be noted here, all these samples are from all these photomicrographs are from the same samples in the same maturity around 0.6%. So you should see this kind of uh, you know, fluorescence in, and that kind of um, thermal maturity range. But when it crosses 0.9%, you should not see anything. So your data needs to match with each other. So I have the bottom ticker like transformation carriage into bitumen to oil. So, but nobody actually ever explained where the bitumen range is. So this is another publication such as Spirit Fair. Sorry, I uh, forgot to put the references in there. This probably came from Dan Jarvie um, and Angel Corielli. Um, so um, carrageen uh, to bitumen to oil. Look at the bitumen uh, to pyrobitumen triangle at the, um, sorry, uh, arrow at the bottom. But the, where is the solid bitumen? Nobody could explain where is the solid bitumen. So solid bitumen is actually a shade. in like so many ranges of solid bitumen can be there from bitumen to pyrobitumen. Bitumen is still a, a liquid, semi-viscous liquid, right? And that transfer into oil, the leftover part turns into solid bitumen that still produces hydrocarbon as it goes to the pyrobitumen stage. So those are the things I wanted to explain clearly. So I took this data and uh, significantly I tried to uh, improve the thermal maturity map in the stack area. And what I found out uh, from this, uh, that thermal maturity actually pushed toward not this direction of the map, a little bit higher. So why we see 0.7% on the then published paper, it was 0.6 or 0.5%. So that basically helped us to extend the acreage of the area that where we can find more liquid hydrocarbon in there. And you can see that uh, we found it actually. So one thing I, the, the, the red lines here, it says uh, 
uh, kerogen um, transformation ratio. So while you see 0.7% good for the maturity, uh, thermal maturity, the kerogen transformation ratio is 0.7%. So that means whatever the hydrocarbon you produce in this location, most of the hydrocarbon should be migrated hydrocarbon even in the wood for shale. Uh, because 0.1% uh, maturity in 0.1% trans, 10% transformation, sorry, I'm saying differently. 10% transformation ratio in kerogen uh, of wood for shale should not produce a 35 or 40 API gravity oil. That's period. You know, wood for the kinetics says, if you look at the kinetics work, 0.7%, uh, 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 sorry, 10% uh, transformation ratio should produce probably vitamin uh, uh, like uh, hydrocarbon, which is about uh, actually thicker than water, it will sink in the water. It's an API gravity equivalent of like less than 10. So just, uh, so it helps the exploration project. So the geochemistry is a key and, and you gotta look at it. So I'm looking, remember that I, I, I showed the chromatogram at the very beginning. Uh, so if you look at the chromatic, so from that chromatogram, I extracted all this arrow at the top chromatogram uh, on uh, you see, uh, around um, uh, normal hydrocarbon um, is about uh, um, uh, 13, um, uh, normal hydrocarbon uh, um, C13 range. So where you say IP13, uh, that means isoprenoid, it's the biomarker and you can get that biomarker in, uh, in a normal GC. So what do you see? All these arrows um, pointing downwards. So see IP13, IP14 and IP15 up to IP20, uh, all this you see there, those are actually, uh, those are uh, all isoprenoids and isoprenoids are precursor of, uh, um, um, you know, um, the biomarker, so you can get it from the GC. So what you see here, um, uh, when I expanded it, the, you can see all these peaks. So I took this data and make a normalized ratio of all the oils, so I averaged it in the Cana field, I have probably hundreds of oils there, and then I, I averaged all the shell work, Kansas, Oklahoma border oils uh, in, a, in, a, in a green dotted line, and the Cana fields are purple dotted line, and I put all the Osage and Maramec oils in between from the stack. So what you see, they are following the similar trend that suggests that these hydrocarbons are coming from a same source rock. The differences you see at the very corner, um, very left-hand side with an arrow, um, that uh, the arrow pointing upward, the higher the, um, uh, the pattern, it shows the higher maturity oil. And the very end, isoprenoid 20, the lower that uh, uh, abundances of IP20, uh, which is uh, phytin, I'll talk about it, uh, that means that oil is more mature. So obviously the cana field, the dotted purple line, which is pointing very down and the IP20 and then on the IP13 on the left, very up. That means this oil, these oils are more mature. And on the other hand, the Kansas Oklahoma border, um, the Northwest part of the stack in upper Northwest part, and uh, those are low maturity oils. So you can see they're staying um, at, at the bottom on the IP20 and the, and the very top on the IP20, sorry, IP13 at the bottom and the IP20 at the very top and all other stack regions oils from the Maramec, they are in between. So they are very following the pattern. Uh, if I put a Parmian oil in there, it's gonna have a different um, pattern. If I put a, a, a oil from a, from a Rockies basins, like Powder River Basin or, or DJ, it can be, it can have a different pattern. So to justify that, uh, I, I, I also, I also put it, uh, that's a Halpern uh, ratio plus C7 ratios. This is not C7 means uh, uh, C, um, uh, the carbon seven, it's, it's a ratio. Uh, he, uh, um, the, the ratios are given from Halpern, he's a famous geochemist and I call him my mentor. Uh, so he, he put it in a star plot. Uh, so these are basically all the hydrocarbon you have in there. Uh, there's a chromatogram on the very bottom, so the zoomed in which C7 compound, components you're taking. All the hydrocarbons you have, like separate, I'll read some of them, 2,2-dimethylpentane two, two at the very first one, and the second one, 2,4-dimethylpentane, meaning eight. This compound has C7 hydrocarbon in there. It's not a straight chain, but it has a, um, um, it has C7 component in there. So it, these are not, uh, he call it C1 ratio to C5, but these are C7 compound. Everybody has C7 com component in it. 
so show the similar pattern. And, uh, and this similar pattern indicates that this Osage, um, um, Woodford, and Merrimack hydrocarbon we find current days, these are all coming from the same source. If again, if I put a hydrocarbon from different basin, like the Nagawar basin from Saudi Arabia, it's going to have a different different pattern. So, so this is how we justify first the oil is coming from the same source. So that is another um, another way of looking at it. As a carbon isotope, remember at the very beginning I said uh, saturates versus aromatics. Um, so we separate those, and then we we do the carbon isotopes. Uh, and we, there is again also a pattern here. You can see. As I said, Kena, west part of the Kena, very close to the kitchen, you have the more mature hydrocarbon, and uh, and and you have uh, the stack and 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 the uh, the upper part of the of the stack, northwest upper part of the stack, or Kansas Oklahoma border. Let's call it this way. They have low maturity. How do we do that? In carbon isotopes, when you mature a hydrocarbon, uh, at the more mature hydrocarbon would have very enriched. Uh, carbon isotope numbers. So on the left axis, you have aromatics on, um, on the x-axis, sorry, y-axis, you have aromatics and uh, x-axis, you have uh, uh, saturates. So if you notice the numbers uh, at the very uh, corner, you have minus 32 for saturates at the left and the very right is minus 22. So that means isotopic numbers is going heavier and heavier uh, and it should be both way. Aromatics should get heavier and saturates gets heavier if it gets mature because it's a kinetic process. So uh, if I if I bring a Barnett hydrocarbon or something, it's gonna plot in a different locations and they're not following, they're not gonna follow the same trend. If I put the Eagle for hydrocarbon, we have, we will have all this hydrocarbon in the lower um, the right corner and then would follow a different trend. And that's what the the reason I'm saying these things from my experience. <laughs> I have looked at a whole lot of uh, data from all these basins that I am I'm talking about. Let's uh, look at the, another one. Uh, remember, stearian biomarkers I talked about. To, I'm over Z218, so I get uh, two little zoomed-in chromatogram from Woodford versus Maramac. You can see the C27 on the left, C28 at the middle, and C29 at the right. All these peaks, they're aligning almost one-to-one. -one. So this is how we geochemists also compare uh, the hydrocarbon from chromatogram to chromatogram. They're coming from the same source. Then we take the ratios, right? And we do normalize different way. So again, so when the time, triangular diagram at the bottom right, uh, you see uh, all the C27, 28, and 29 uh, a stearine biomarker. Uh, they are all plotting at the top of each other. That tells you something. It tells us that these are the hydrocarbon uh, produced from the same source rocks, but they migrated into many different reservoirs, but they still hold the similar biomarker ratios. Uh, one thing, like if I, I'll give you an example. If I have to put something, uh, uh, hydrocarbon from an Indonesian basin, uh, like, you know, all this uh, offshore basin in Indonesia, like they're going to be plotting at the very right corner of the C29 steroid. Uh, because they had they came from uh, something like uh, um, uh, uh, the plant residues and things like that, the kerogens uh, from uh, plant-related organic matter, like and cuticles and stuff like that. We see their signatures in there. There's a there's one published paper by uh, I forgot that name, uh, <laughs> but you know the, there is a paper out there. You can you can see those. Uh, if anybody needs it, I can I can send it. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Oh my. Okay, so taking all this uh, data, uh, what we uh, we geochemists, as uh, as I said, we do, we try to you know, understand the fluid maturity from the from the gas and oil. Here, you can do it many different ways. In this case, I you know I I did I, I looked at mostly biomarkers and uh, and light hydrocarbons, and you can uh, um, I'll I'll talk about these plots. So you can do gas chromatography data, the GC data, you can you can convert into thermal maturity. You can take a simple uh, gravity, API gravity, or, or the viscosity of the oil, uh, like some engineering things uh, that um, we like to do. Um, um, so we, we can take those numbers and make a correlations, make some sort of um, models. So uh, and and then and then and then take those uh, models and apply in your data set and get the maturity data. And then these are correlatable with the uh, 
with other engineering data set like you know uh, phase data, pressure data. You know, pressure data has been even uh, uh, complemented through geochemistry data. There is a published paper by uh, uh, by Talisman Group, I think Talisman Energy Chatelier Chateliers at all. And back in 2024, they tried to predict the pressure uh, through the geochemistry data. So it's very important uh, to do the geochemistry. So carbon isotope can be used. Uh, SORA composition can be used. Uh, many different sets of biomarker can be used uh, to, to find out the GOR and, 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 and the maturity of the hydrocarbon. So in this case, uh, on the bottom left, uh, I have M over Z231. It's an aromatic biomarker. It's called triaromatic sterains. So you have to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, the big peaks you see. So you see, take the light uh, and that steroid, triaromatic steroid over the summation of all steroid and it gives you a number. That number is very correlatable to, um, uh, to your thermal maturity of the, uh, of the rock. So here on the right hand at the top, you, we have uh, the, hap the haptane value is the C7 compound component. So we calculate, uh, put a value and then that value is correlated with the thermal maturity equivalent from triaromatic and biomarkers or any other sort of biomarkers. And you see the correlation is almost 100%, 0.96. And at the uh, bottom um, right, you have the API gravity for all these oils and then the biomar biomarker maturity equivalent from uh, triaromatic sterene. And you can see that relationship is also almost 100%, 0.95. So that's a very unique, you have the formula, you can apply it, but I, I caution everybody, it has to be played by play case by play case. You know, some play, some basins uh, may uh, not have it, the uh, triaromatic terrain as soon as you cross 1% maturity equivalent. Uh, some basins, some oils may have. So you got to look at those, uh, those chromatogram and geochemistry and create those data, data set to calibrate your, uh, your model. So So what we took here, so I'm putting here on this slide, uh, um, API gravity, source rock RO, meaning the maturities from source rock, oil RO equivalent. Um, uh, so oil RO equivalent is uh, you have this oil bar marker and, and converting to the RO uh, thermal maturity, and then the GOR. So the first some of the GOR number in my model came straight from the production GOR with from the engineers. Uh, so. I'm giving just an example from on the map on the right hand side. You can see all this uh, A, B, C, D through F. So F is uh, basically very low maturity oil, uh, and then uh, A is the very high maturity oil. Uh, all these locations also we had core data. Um, we have the rock exactly from there. We had cuttings, and of course in this map behind the uh, all this the map had a lot of thermal maturity data collected from cuttings, cores, and historical legacy cuttings. So we, we know that that map is very, very fine tuned. So let's go to the left-hand side of the table, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, uh, so API gravity, you can see A is the most mature oil, 46.8 API gravity. And the F is the most uh, least mature oil, 35 API gravity, which is very black oil, I would say. Um, so. And that exact locations, when you look at the rock, thermal maturity, uh, our low kerogen on the third column, you see a, a holds 1% maturity equivalent, uh, thermal maturity, not, it says the mat thermal maturity, not equivalent, is straight you know, organic petrography data. And then the very bottom one in app locations, you have 0.7% maturity. So now uh, try to look at the following columns, RO from biomarker. Uh, why do you have 0.7% low maturity in app location? on the map, you have 0.9% maturity equivalent um, oil, but your rock is 0.7%. So you have almost 20%, not more than 20% actually when you do percentage was 0.2%, 0.2 difference in, in real value. Uh, at the top, the A locations of the deeper part of the basin, you see 1.12, uh, which is 1.1% um, biomarker equivalent uh, fluid, whereas your rock maturity is, 1%, so you have differences almost 0.12. So, and it's these the differences are very consistent when you took uh, the VREQ5. This is, I think, um, a geomark. They put together 26 different biomarkers and make a, a maturity equivalent. And my maturity calculations is very, very uh, 
linearly correlated with this. And we also have same ones. We had a diamondoid. So remember, diamondoid is another thing. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it is a, it is a it is organic structure and it gets concentrated in the rock as the rock gets the oil or um, uh, or the kerogen gets the, the more mature you know, oil would have more concentration of diamond bars. Diamond bars has different types, but higher percentage of diamond bars indicates higher maturity fluid. And then you see on the very last column, the uh, predicted GR. Uh, uh, predicted GR, basically you take these data and come convert it to a GOR, we have some equations and we do that. Uh, so you can predict a GOR, almost 5,000 GOR at the A locations, whereas in the F locations, you have 700 GOR, 800. So, so you can design your, your, your portfolio based on this. And this is very, very well correlated with that. So what we found on one keynote is here, the host organic matter maturity is significantly lower than that of the produced oil over most of the studied area. So this is uh, this is the, a concept I used in Permian Basin, uh, Rockies Basin, as well in, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Contour offshore, and it just holds very, very true. But of course, when you do try to do conventional uh, well, uh, they, this is, you have to be very careful. This is, I'm talking about non-conventional fields. So if we uh, take this data here on the left-hand side, kerosene maturity versus oil maturity, how do we do that? Uh, look at that uh, left-hand. So the bigger arrows indicates bigger migrations. So where you see 0.1% oil equivalent, the, the thick uh, dotted uh, uh, black lines, 1% equivalent maturity fluid is uh, getting posted by 0.7% equivalent drop. So as you go from the kitchen, this is the beauty of the first slide I show you. As you go, as you go far away from the kitchen, you see more migration. So like, for example, Kansas shell for the Northern Kansas, you see all these oils, there is no wood for source shock there. So hydrocarbon has to migrate from all the way from, from the deeper part of the Antarctic region. This is how we know that those are migrated hydrocarbon. You know, I think I, I talked to my friends and colleagues that, you know, in the Kansas from north to um, south to north, if you find an oil from well, the southern part of Kansas and then and find another oil from the northern part of the Kansas, you see that oil chemistry is pretty similar, but there is no change. The reason there is no change is because these are all migrated hydrocarbon, and these migrations probably happen on a single phase migration. So a huge flood came in of the oil and pushed it out all the way and got it in reservoir. So on the right hand side here on the on the picture you see here thermal maturity model basically the data from whole and Antarctic basin they should follow a line if it is a single basin yes it is following a line so there are other dots here you you see I put all this oil that I I had on this map on the left hand side I put this oil all are the dot the the red um, uh, blank dots uh, the red circles. You can see those red circles are completely, um, you know, what is happening. Red circles are are basically very far away from the trend line. That means you have a significant difference. As oil maturity is higher than the rock maturity. That's also another indication that most of these oils in different reservoirs are migrated, uh, whether it is a few miles or tens of miles. It is there, and as you see at the very uh, bottom of those red lines, they're kind of sinking into the to the trend line. The reason is that as you go very high maturity, um, above 1.3% maturity equivalent fluid, you may not see a lot of biomarkers. So my my model encountered most of the biomarker maturity equivalent, but we can do the light hydrocarbon maturity, then it would not. Deeper part, if you have some oil with a higher high gas contents, you can still, uh, still do this uh, lines. So I have another to gas chemistry data. So we can do the similar thing with the gas chemistry. So sometimes your gas chemistry, you look at on the left, the left top uh, one is the thermal maturity uh, calculations. Basically you can do from uh, uh, methane and ethane isotopes. And then you have a net there where it says how much percentage of uh, bacterial degradations, meaning how much bacteria influenced your methane data mostly. So you, and then you have a, maturity um, uh, points. So you, you can take those maturity or you can calculate it, or you can model it. 
At the very bottom, you can see it's a wood for source stock uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, or gas produced. Uh, the trend line, uh, sorry, uh, the pattern here uh, at the bottom left, I'm sorry, my mouse is not moving, <laughs> the red one, so I couldn't point it. Uh, uh, from C1 through C5, carbon isotopes, so you guys see the patterns are pretty same. This is kind of an equivalent of a chunk plot, but I did it in a different way. I just put it straight on the x-axis, uh, all the carbon component, and then y-axis, all the carbon isotope numbers. You see the pattern is pretty similar. So that indicates these are from the same source rock, but they are uh, they are they're different maturities. Very uh, very at the top trend line shows the high maturity uh, fluid, and the very bottom is the low maturity fluid. And I transferred these data on the thermal maturity plot. On the right hand side, you can see uh, see one of the gas data, uh, the the kind of a kind of a greenish um, uh, dots. You see this is far away from the trend line. That means that gas is a very high maturity gas that has to migrate that up from deeper source, whereas the other maturity gases are pretty following the trend lines, not following the gas trends. Because one thing uh, I have to say, the gas maturity uh, calculations has been a challenge. If we use the traditional conventional shoal plot to calculate the maturity or, uh, or uh, a favor plot that uh, we had uh, uh, historically published that we use, those actually doesn't, doesn't follow the similar trend. We see uh, the hydrocarbon gas gas um, uh, isotopes number is way so different than the conventional field isotope numbers. And I think many geochemists would agree with me. And I talk about that a lot. So gas maturity uh, calculations is sometimes can be very tricky if we don't know what we are doing. Uh, methane should not be part of uh, part of the maturity calculations. Usually propane and uh, uh, ethane and propane is, is the isotopes we use for maturity calculations. Okay. okay. Uh, Looks like I got stuck on this line. Okay, here you go. So we took this, uh, so traditionally, if you have a, a maturity data, like on the left-hand top, uh, oil maturity versus gas maturity, if you have gas and oil coming from the same source of not too much migration stored in the same reservoir, they should be plotting that line. But we don't see that. We see a variation in that, which is very normal. That's uh, that's why we do some. Uh, the, on the bottom right, um, um, the bottom uh, on the first uh, X Y plot on the maturities, um, uh, you see uh, the gas somewhere where you have um, you know, oil maturity is higher than the gas maturity, uh, and then at the very top left corner of that same plot, the ga uh, gas maturity, uh, gas R V equivalent is higher than oil R V equivalent. So that means wherever you see gas maturity is higher, that means you have a migrated gas in, uh, when then. Whatever you see low maturity in the gas, that means you you have high maturity gas and the oil migrated in. So if you map it on the right hand side, you can see there are some uh, hot uh, hot areas that are red and yellow colors. Those are the places where you see uh, the Maramac, uh, the yellow colors. Maramac and wood force are holding the similar maturity where you see the red Maramac is higher than the wood force. And the question is how how come Maramac has high maturity hydrocarbons, whereas the source surface below is not that high. Uh, so that means the Maramac is holding a hydrocarbon which has a migration from a deeper part of the um, deeper part of the um, um, kitchen uh, th through a fault and migrated laterally and then stored in the Mar Maramac. So that's that's the that's the explanations and where you have the purple color that you know Maramac maturity is uh, lower than the Woodford maturity, which is probably pretty normal because Woodford is a source rock and it migrates and whatever it gets. Uh, Gets a passage and then it goes to the reservoir, but oftentimes the source of should be more mature and then migrate the hydrocarbon should be less mature and stayed in the reservoir, right? So higher maturity Maramac uh, wells are associated with the higher maturity gases. Uh, so that's the conclusion here. So again, looking at this uh, maturity and uh, I didn't talk about GOR so much, so you can see on the left and top uh, X Y plot. So it's predicted GOR versus uh, produced GOR. This is 30 days GOR from uh, from the um, from the production, uh, and then the GOR calculated from from geochemistry. The relationship is pretty darn good. It's almost point point nine. So 90 percent correlation. And you can take date data and map it. And you know when you map it on the right hand side, you can see the map tells you very very 
to a very unique process, the following the thermal maturity trend and everything, but you also see some, uh, some hot spot there, like where you have higher maturity fluid in there. And so that's the, that's the thing. And I want to put one line. If fluid gets very high, um, um, very light, and a gas rich, this, uh, then this, uh, this method may not be very working very well because you are losing your biomarker. So then you have to convert the maturities from the gas uh, and other, other fluids, uh, not the biomarkers, just the light, light hydrocarbon uh, maturity. So that can be done. And I think I applied it in other, other unconventional basins as well. So here is uh, the map uh, from um, Merrimack fluid maturity. So here you see the chaotic. Remember the first plot uh, where I had purple, red, and um, another color. So here, uh, some of the places you see Merrimack is holding high maturity oil. So the so that the, um, the Merrimack has a little bullseye on the left hand column. So higher maturity fluid, higher GUR fluid in there. So that's pretty common. High GURs in some of these Merrimack wells actually correspond with the combinations of high fluid maturity. Most likely uh, they have a charge two different ways. So you had the first charge came in from the wood portion shop, uh, laterally um, with, with the vertical migration, then a lateral migration. Then at some point, fall control, hydrocarbon migration during Pennsylvania or Lake Pennsylvania time. They had those, those fault map I showed you from the geophysical side. And those are the, those are the fine tuned uh, locations where we see high GOR oils and they're probably a secondary charge came from a deeper source. And that make this uh, more mature fluid in the Maramax. So with that, I think I'm pretty close to conclusions. So uh, do geochemistry um, uh, when you do uh, drill wells in this unconventional basin and uh, try to uh, figure this data with uh, uh, gas data or thermal maturity from the rocks and, uh, and, 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 and the gas and oil uh, geochemistry stuff. So, so all these data actually match very well to uh, Woodford and Maramac reservoirs in the stack area of the Anadarko basins are definitely sourced from uh, uh, Woodford and, uh, and migrated up deep directions. Uh, all uh, different biomarkers, maturities and gas maturities, uh, they are in an excellent agreement. And maturity of produced hydrocarbon can be a very key parameter to understand your, your fluid behavior productions and also forecast your preserver and expand your portfolio and stuff. And, and the GOR has very, very uh, close match with uh, 30 day, even 60 days. Uh, I wish I had more time to show you all those. And most of the Maramac oils in, in, this, uh, in this area charged probably by single phase hydrocarbon migrations, but some anomalies are there. And then that could be probably having some uh, secondary or tertiary migrations, which uh, we couldn't explain all of it uh, in a single uh, study. So many studies needs to be done to understand this, this better. And, and to help uh, the field energy economics. Thank you so very much. I would be happy to take uh, take calls. If you have any questions uh, for me, I'm here. I will try to see if I can look at the questions here. Oh. Thank you, Wahi. This was amazing. So informative. So we do have some questions. An anonymous participant asks, what was the I, I so uh, I, isoprenoid data normalized to? Uh, what was the question again, Suzanne? What was the, it's in the Q&A. So oh, yes. Okay. Isoprenoid data is normalized to isoprenoid. So basically what happened, you took the isoprenoid data. Uh, we took uh, the area of each isoprenoid and I summed it up and I divided up with the summation. So that's what you can do it many ways. I take individual isotope uh, isoprenoid data area, and then I took all the isoprenoid area and took it as 100% and divide that uh, to the individual isoprenoid. So that's why you see the ratio is too low, but you can also, you know, to make it look better, you can multiply the, the, the number with 100%. So that would look a little bit even better. So I see a questions from, my uh, my uh, one of my mentors, I should say, uh, I call him friends, Henry. I have two questions. Whose questions did you? Whose equations did you use to correct bitumen reflections to? Yeah. So I'm a very famous fan of Jacobi's. So I I found out there are many equations out there. Many of them does not work. I can say boldly, and the Jacobi ones work the most. 
So I used the Jacobi 1989 publications, I think, and that's what I did. Uh, and I have been still using that. And I think at some point we can make one <laughs> from a specific basin. And the second question from Henry was, what is the typical oil production for a for well in the basin for in situ oil per day? I would defer these questions to all one of the engineers because I don't keep up with these numbers. So I don't want to give the wrong numbers. Uh, um, so I'm not sure about that. Sorry, Henry and talk personally on that. Susan, you have any more questions? And I see more questions here. Um, yeah, so Susan, go ahead and answer them. Okay, Sean Wright. Sean, thanks for adding in the talk. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> interesting talk. How confident are you that the offset is calculated maturity between kerogen and the oil are not just a function of measurement being performed on a different physical fractions? For example, are the biomarkers being fractionated or affected during migrations so that the kerogen has an observed maturity that is lower than the actual? Um, no, Sean, I, I, I would uh, probably very, very confident because I've been doing it for years. And uh, I, as you know, I have a, a, a background of organic petrology, so I also do microscopy work, and I, I do. Um, so I am very, very confident that the kerogen maturities are right. What I can calculate the way I actually try to differentiate between uh, uh, hydrogen uh, dissociations from kerogen um, uh, versus uh, the maturity increase. So that is why you also see the graphite is the most uh, uh, mature thing. If you look at the graphite maturity, it's about 14%. I think there is a paper published by Maria Masterlarge back in, I couldn't figure out the year from Indiana Bloomington. Um, uh, it was probably around, uh, I have that paper if you guys need that. But that tells, you know, thermal maturity of the graphite is too high. So in, in these basins, you know, 1.3% maturity is we are done for, for the oil if the rock holds that kind of maturity. But the oil can hold maturity higher than 1.3%. If you can get it from the light hydrocarbon, I think Henry can chime in there if he needs to. He does hydro, light hydrocarbon work a lot. So, you know, you will not find too much oil when you go to the higher maturity fluid. You would find gas, but still you can have um, a wet gas in there. So I can talk about this offline and more on that. I am very confident because I have done these similar studies for in Parmian, Eagleford, uh, Rockies Basins, many. I actually published one of the papers uh, just uh, last year. Uh, you can look at that one on DJ Basin. Uh, I, I actually applied all three sets of data uh, differently. So I'll move into the next questions again. Anonymous participant, uh, thanks. Follow up. Uh, um, have you considered possible effects of biodegradations on isoprenoids? Well, thank you so much. To be honest, I would say um, I would say yes. Uh, but for these oils, we don't see any biodegradations. You can uh, chromatograms. I showed you one of them, pretty pretty pristine uh, GC chromatogram. So biodegradation would affect the data. But at the same time, when you have this kind of biodegradations, you may not have a whole lot of isoprenoids there. Because you know, biodegradations is basically uh, chop up all those <laughs> um, heavier hydrocarbon, uh, and you won't have anything in there. So it would influence uh, for sure. It would affect. But for our case study, we don't have any biodegradation. Many of these uh, unconventional reservoirs, uh, we don't see much biodegradations. Yes, if you talk about biodegradations, if you go to the uh, historical um, uh, fields in uh, uh, North, uh, yeah, I would say. An apartment basin on the around the shelf where you have the San Andres uh, reservoirs, you do see a lot of biodegradations. But if you go, say, for example, Wolfgang Sprayberry or you know any sort of uh, bone spring, we don't see much biodegradations. Um, in the similar case in uh, Maramac Woodford, and 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 you know if you go to the Kansas shelf, yes, you can see some biodegradation. But I don't have the data to point out. Uh, you may have some biodegradations on those. Next question uh, from Patrick Tolson, if I pronounced right. Sorry, I have an accent. 
Uh, any explanations why the Osage hydrocarbons in primarily gas, but is is between Maramac, between Maramac and Woodford? Mm, to be honest, I didn't put too much time. Like I said in the previous uh, previous um, uh, questions, answered that you know if you go to the Kansas, uh, Oklahoma. Um, Northern Oklahoma to uh, to Kansas, uh, Oklahoma border. Yes, you see a lot of uh, um, oil with uh, the gas-rich hydrocarbon. There could be two explanations. I don't have a chromatogram in front of me. I could have very easily put the biodegradations in there, but if I don't see the chromatogram properly, I can't say that, right? But one thing I would say, you know, it's the shell on the Osage area on the on the north side. You have a lot of basement falls. If you remember uh, the first one. Uh, I don't know whether that affected anything. Elevated basement, granitic basement usually is a, is a high heat flow in there. So that can fractionate the, the reservoir and then uh, oil, oil can transfer into partially uh, gases as well because of the heat. So if I see, uh, like, say, for example, I can bring an example from uh, Gulf of Mexico. Like, you know, if you see any oils that has like, well, field has high gas field, you can look at the chromatogram, you see nothing but too much methane in there. So the methane is a uh, very interesting uh, isotope number. It needs to be there. So if you see some methane isotope number very high, uh, very light, like minus 60 above, well, I would say minus 50 or minus 60 above. So you can see, yes, there is a biodegradation and biodegradations could be the key factor for producing a lot of gases. But for Kansas, uh, Oklahoma border, uh, some of the chromatograms I looked at, we don't see much biodegradation effect. I would probably, uh, probably put it uh, uh, to the heat flow uh, local. You know, you also have Nimaha uh, Ridge, uh, Nimaha um, eyes there. So those could be something and more geologists are there to, to explain it better than I do. So that would be my take on that. The next question is from uh, Ali Reja. And just Thank to you. jump in here, this one has to be our last one. We're way over time, but this has been such an amazing and informative and valuable presentation. I didn't want to cut anybody off. So anyway, if you don't mind answering this last one, this is wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Nice, nice presentations. Any work on showing the migration distance, uh, for example, based on a benzocarbazole uh, ratio? No, I particularly did not use that, uh, that particular ratio, but I'd be happy to look at some of them and the, the migration, one thing is key that the anodar basin has a lot of migrated hydrocarbon in there. From our little study area and the stack scoop area, we see the migration is from, from few miles to 20 miles. Somewhere around that, all, all those arrows indicated, indicated, you will probably have a recorded copy of that. So you can contact me. Uh, we can we'd be happy to work together on that. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. This has just been amazing. I really, really appreciate it. Oops, was my, my, my still you didn't know. I just want to remind everyone that you will be getting an email from me with a link to the presentation and um, to the recording. It'll take me a, a, a while to get it done. I'm traveling right now. Thank, and I want to thank the Amazon Web Services office since we're letting me use their, their space. But at any rate, um, want to thank you and want to encourage you to also um, sign up for our next webinars, which will be coming up next week and the week after. And they have to do with, with um, different types of, of questions about uh, measure gas measurements and EPA compliance and orphan wells. And that will be next week. I want to thank our sponsors. We have a number of them, and I'll, I'll list them when we um, in the website. And again, thank you very much. And thank you, Wahid. That was amazing. It's my pleasure, and thank you very much. And thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.